All right. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Renegade HPG podcast. I am very excited today to be joined by Robert Charette, one of the founding fathers of the Battletech universe. Robert's novels, Wolves on the Border and Heir to the Dragon, helped lay the foundation for the Battletech universe, and the miniatures he sculpted helped bring that universe to life on the tabletop. We'll be talking about those early years of the game today and the work and collaborations that gave birth to this universe we all know and love. Bob, thanks for joining me. Sure. Glad to be here. Um, so kind of in those early years, where exactly was Battletech in the development process when you kind of connected with, um, you know, with FASA and uh, the guys that were in developing? Well, actually, the, the, it's two different questions. Okay. <laughs> um, I had connected with FASA before there was a Battletech. Um, in fact, uh, back when FASA, FASA's business was doing supplements for the Traveler role-playing game. Okay. Uh, and uh, had a talk with Jordan Weissman back then, and he uh, actually uh, suggested that FASA could do supplements for uh, my Bushido role-playing game. Uh, they never came about, but that's, that's how we first got into conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, of course, later played into Battletech stuff. Yeah, yeah. But... Uh, now, I first encountered Battletech when they premiered it at a GameCon. Okay. Uh, I can't remember if it was an Origins or a Gen Con. I think it was probably an Origins. Uh, and it piqued my interest. And uh, there obviously were no miniatures at that point. Right. Uh, there were just the two plastic models that came in the, uh, the box set. It was a Shadowhawk and maybe a Griffin. You know, were those two? Uh, in Battletech but, terms, yeah, yeah they're yeah. both Dugan <laughs> yeah, right. robots. Yeah. Uh, but uh, and I thought robots were pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, first, particularly giant walking tanks, right? Mm. Um, and I had already had some model kits from Macross uh, because you know my Warhammer. I can see it behind your head, yep. right? Yep. You know, that's that's one of the most awesome designs ever. It's just perfect. Yeah. Uh, no. No, not, not a surprise they chose it for the, the cover girl for the, uh, <laughs> the game. Yeah. Yeah, it is a, it is a sexy one. But, uh, you know, I, uh, I don't know if you'd seen uh, one of the artists had done a, a modern uh, rendition of it, which was a great, great little update. Uh, it goes by Spooky on DeviantArt. And uh, Florian Mellies is, is the artist's name. But uh, if you haven't seen it, I'll send you, I'll, I'll email you the kind of copy of the picture. But it looks it looks gorgeous. But yeah, it's definitely stood the test of time. You know, that, uh, <laughs> that old Warhammer. Um, yeah, well, I think one of the things that drove Fossa to... Uh, basically borrow, shall we say, the, all those mm -hmm. designs, uh, was the fact that the, for the Japanese anime, they, those guys went through a serious industrial design process. Um, you know, I, would, I had picked up a few uh, Japanese modeling slash hobby magazines back in the day, completely in Japanese, but, you know, the pictures were in English. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the universal no, language. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And they would have lots of images, you know, different angles of these things, things that were probably used as uh, model sheets for the uh, animation. But before that, you know, they did iterations of the design till they got it looking really cool. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, that kind of thing makes overall for, for better design than you know, handing someone a brief and say, okay, I need 50 mechs by, uh, oh, next week. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you get some awkward ones out of that. There's, there's some that yeah. haven't stood the test of time, but fortunately the early ones uh, held up pretty well. It was kind of later on where they got a little bit funky. But um, well, I might have a disagreement with you. There. Okay, okay. <laughs> Uh, okay. Um, so what, other than the Warhammer, you know, certainly you sculpted a lot. Did you get to pick the ones that you sculpted or were they kind of handed to you? Um, Did you kind of get to, to cherry pick your favorites and say, I'll do this one, this one, this one? Well, it's a, it's kind of a long story. Uh, I mean, obviously you introduced Michael who's doing the Charette collection stuff mm -hmm. and, you know, he's posted up a bunch of stuff I've talked to him about as some of his, his posts uh, and some of the early experience with that. Um, but, you know, you had asked how I got involved in Battletech, and um, 
you know, I, I came away from that original convention really interested in it. And, uh, one of the other guys at Ralph Pother also thought it had, you know, some possibilities and stuff. And uh, that was Chuck Crane. Uh, he was one of the owners. And uh, pretty much the two of us were the only ones at Ralph Pother who were interested in this thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, the other owners were convinced to make a pitch for doing the Battle Max. And since I was the only sculptor interested in it, I was tasked to do the proof of concept okay. because Ralph Partha had a reputation for uh, organic sculptures, right? And they didn't do a lot of machines. Okay. Uh, so there was some trepidation on Foss's part that Ralph Partha had sculptors who could do machines. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the fact that the designs are partly organic uh, helps. Yeah. Um, so I did the first miniature, uh, which was based on a Robotech Valkyrie. Um, and it was sent up to FASA and they approved it. They decided that Partha could do it. So then yeah. we got the assignment. And uh, but the, uh, the uh, owners at Ralph Partha also uh, were a little concerned about the connection with the Japanese imagery. Yeah, understandably. Right. And this was about the same time that FASA was getting their, you can't use the name Battle Droids because it's got droids in it. Okay. And we own that, said Lucasfilm. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like, okay. <laughs> which is which is a questionable thing, but yeah, I can see it. It, it is questionable. They certainly didn't have it trademarked at that point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but you know, a company like Fasa didn't have the pockets to argue with Lucasfilm after Star Wars success. Right. Um, and this would have been what in eighty four, eighty three. No, earlier, certainly. I, okay. I'm, I'm not going to be very good at giving you exact <laughs> stuff, Fair. Okay? That was a long time ago. Uh, it was a long time ago. Uh, almost 40 years. Something like that. Um, yep. And, you know, like, you might not even have been around. Uh, yeah, I was, <laughs> my, my 40th is next week. So, I, and I was, I came out at, in 1980. So, uh, <laughs> but, uh, so the, the whole battle droids uh, thing came up. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I got a very, you know, okay, we, we need to do all the mechs, but we don't want them to look like the Japanese ones. So we don't yeah. step on that, that toe. So we're going to do battle droids mm -hmm. and we need them right away. <laughs> of course, you need everything right away in business, yeah. right? <laughs> so, you know, don't make them look exactly like the other ones but you know make sure they got all the guns in the right places <laughs> and you know that's how most of the battle droids came about gotcha and and that was so that was the the original the battle droids line of miniatures and then when was yeah. the when was the transition then to the to the battle mechs? Um, well i did all of those original ones mm -hmm. and then there were a couple more added to it during the transition period okay. uh, julie guthrie had done a uh, a much closer to the anime look archer and a uh, not quite a locus you know a little crossbreed with an atst yeah. uh, the flea mm -hmm. um, and they had originally been done to be battle droids as the the company decided they wanted the line to expand mm -hmm. after um, you know sufficient success uh, with the battle droids um, I'm a little hazy about, you know, just how things played out. Uh, uh, and this was, that stuff all happened uh, before or just as the first technical readout was coming out. Okay. Right. And uh, uh, we never got the technical readouts before they came out at Ralph Partha, right? You know, okay. we had the miniature line. <laughs> well, we got would, to see the new mechs as soon as everybody else did. That would make your job too easy. You know, I, I talked to, uh, I had a well, conversation with Blaine and he was talking just how the novels, how he doesn't even see the novels before they, they he can buy them in the store. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Well, you know, the, the, 
the tech readout would come out at a convention mm -hmm. and the guys at Fossa would say, so when are we getting the Max? Yeah. Oh boy. You know, when are we going to, when are we going to have the metal? And it's like, uh, we just got the dang things. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, obviously the first priority was to do the ones that were in the original game. Yeah. And by then the, the word had come down. Well, the first ones we did, the word was do, them exactly like the model kits, which we did, including size. Oh, okay. Because that was the brief. They said, copy yeah, the model exactly. kit. They said exactly. Right? Yeah. Okay. And that resulted in things like the giant Griffin and giant Shadowhawk mm -hmm. and the oversized Stinger and Wasp. Uh, well, oversized now, uh, as we know. Um, so they were available for a certain period of time. And um, I think the Shadowhawk and the Griffin were the first ones to be replaced. Okay. Um, I know I ran a couple of those in games as uh, Super Shadowhawk and Super Griffin at 100 <laughs> tons. <laughs> yeah. Could be but, a uh, clan design or something, a redesign. But, um, oh, that was done. The, the, the clads did not exist. At this yeah, point. yeah, that's a way later. <laughs> What uh, you know? What got you into sculpting? Um, you know, I I remember reading that you you did you go to Brown University? Did I read that correctly? Yes. And um, and so kind of where did you know between that that education, which I, I don't think was in, <laughs> in art and sculpting, you know, kind of how, what got you into that? And you know, what kind of helped well, you develop those skills that you that you started a letter chair? My degree is in geology biology. Okay. Because Brown didn't have a paleontology degree. Okay. Um, there. In those days, this is pre-Jurassic Park. Yeah. There, there wasn't a lot of work for people who wanted a job in dinosaurs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I had always been a, a drawer. I would, you know, uh, draw all kinds of things. And uh, I spent, uh, out of college, I got a job doing graphic arts work. Uh, this was back before you could do it all on your computer. <laughs> you know, so, you know, it's rubber cement and exacto blades and it, uh, it was, it was work. It wasn't yeah. terribly creative, but it was work. Um, and this was also the time I was working on the various role playing games that uh, I designed with my collaborator, Paul Hume. And, uh, I was doing art for those and, and, uh, you know, doing art for a couple of small game companies and such. Um, one of the early gaming pieces I did actually uh, was uh, for a contest that TSR was running in Dragon Magazine. Okay. They were, you know, draw the monster. Uh, and they provided a, uh, a short clip from Fritz Lieber's Faffer and the Grey Mouser stories, um, which was the thing that became the D&D hook horror. Okay. And uh, I won that contest uh, with the piece I did. So. Excellent. <laughs> and then that was, that was, that was drawing and how did, how did, you know, where did, or when you were sculpting kind of what uh, was that just kind of okay. self-taught uh, trial and error? Did you have any kind of, you know, someone to mentor you, you know? I'm pretty much self-taught. Okay. Um, uh, you know, all, this stuff is all tied together. You know, of I course. mean, I got, got into D and D uh, in the original edition. You know, back in the days when you had to call a hobby shop to find out if they'd gotten any polyhedral dice in that week. <laughs> um, so you could rush down there and get them before somebody bought them. Well, there's no lack of dice in the gaming world these days. No, it's, not anymore. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, and also those dice were so soft, they would eventually, the, all the corners would round off. Oh boy. And so they just keep rolling, yeah. uh, which was not popular either. No, not at all. Uh, but I was playing role-playing games and we were having trouble keeping track of where the characters were when fights occurred. So, you know, we started using miniatures to do that. And eventually I decided I would try to do some. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, showed them to the guy who ran the shop that I visited and 
you know, he insisted they were the, at least the peer of, uh, you know, what he was selling. Mm -hmm. And so I eventually got connected to a series of small companies sculpting various miniatures. And, and what were uh, what were the materials that you were sculpting out of? Originally, I was uh, I was sculpting in Sculpey, okay, which is a a thermo setting plastic material. Mm -hmm. I bake it in a toaster oven. Okay, <laughs> so it was hard enough. Yeah. Um, now that's really a terrible material for the process that was being used for most of these things, mm -hmm. which involves vulcanized rubber, and. Uh, vulcanization is a high temperature, high pressure process, and it would destroy this material. Uh, so the you know the first companies I worked with, um, they would have to use a, a room temperature vulcanizing material to make a mold, and then cast metal into that to make a master, and then do the vulcanizing. Okay. So it's you know an extra step for right. companies that had very small margins. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and eventually I was, uh, I was doing that while I was working for Fantasy Games Unlimited and I'd done some pieces for them in, in the Sculpey. And at some convention or other, I don't remember which one it was, I took a few pieces over to show to, the, to Tom Meyer at Ralph Partha. And, he, uh, he actually wouldn't believe I had done them in Sculpey. Um, they didn't think you could do that kind of detail yeah. at the size I was doing it because these were 15 millimeter science fiction figures. Yep. Um, uh, so that's, that's when I got told about green stuff, uh, as it was called. Yeah. And uh, very challenging medium to learn. <laughs> yeah. The the green stuff or the uh, the uh, super sculpty the the green stuff the, green uh, green stuff you know, the, uh, the sculpty had its own challenges mm -hmm. uh, the green stuff was a uh, uh, two part epoxy right that you'd mix together and that's what it would turn green because mm -hmm. you know yellow and blue yep yep and uh, it would slowly harden so its characteristics would change during the entire period you were working on it. Uh, it's often been described as trying to sculpt in bubble gum. Okay. Uh, I've uh, I've only used it to connect two parts, and so I haven't done much sculpting in it. But yeah. uh, I gotta imagine there's there's a uh, there's just a time curve of kind of <laughs> how much yeah, it, how much softness. It, it, which I guess when you're the more you do it, the more you can kind of use that to your benefit. You know, but uh, well, you know, like any craft that involves a lot of eye hand coordination mm -hmm. and um, uh, training. When you start it, you, oh man, I could never do that. I, and, and, and you can't at mm -hmm. first, but you know, 20 years later, it's like, okay, you just do it this way. No problem. Yeah. And you're doing things that you thought you could never do. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, you know, Perseverance pays off, you yeah. know, if, if you pay attention to your learning. Well, it's the uh, the ten thousand hour rule, right? You know, ten thousand hours of uh, yeah, of the playing with the magic, green the stuff. Magic number, yeah, <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> it's a lot of hours playing with green stuff, but uh, you get there. What uh, do you have a, a favorite miniature uh, that you kind of came up with that you're like you you always look at me like you and I we've been through a lot, but uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, people ask me that about the novels, and yeah. you know, that's a very small number. Yeah. Compared to the number of miniatures I have made at this point. Yep. Um, I mean, yeah, there's definitely some I like better than others, mm -hmm. but I also like them for different reasons, which makes yeah. it very hard to yeah. pick a single one. Uh -huh. uh, you know, some of the mechs, and you know, I'll, I'll stick with Battletech here because that's what yeah. we're, we're talking about, you know. Uh, you know, some of them I like a lot because I like the designs, mm. uh, but I have others that, well, I'll pick I'll, I'll name one. The, the Caesar is a design I didn't much care for, okay. but I, it ended up on my sculpting list. Yeah. But in the process of doing it, the, it came out so well, and I felt that I had achieved an improvement on the rough sketch that's in the, 
tech manual to make yeah. it work in three dimensions. And no, just everything was working on all cylinders when I was working on that one. Yeah, yeah it's kind of a goofy design, but mm -hmm. I still like it a lot. You know, that's, that's, that's amazing that you said it because the, uh, the Caesar is one of my favorite of the old mechs and not a lot. And the miniatures is what drove it. So, you know, you, it's kind of inspired me as well to kind of appreciate that model. It's, uh, <laughs> it's actually, I've been, uh, I st started teaching myself to paint earlier this year and almost all of the stuff I've painted has been the, the newer plastic stuff. And the Caesar is the only one that I, uh, I actually took the time to, magnetize the metal sculpt and it's got both arms magnetized and the uh the gauss rifle on the front and uh, i've got it primed and i'm like i don't want to uh, uh paint it until my skills get better because uh, i spent so much time getting that magnetization perfect <laughs> especially that little cannon uh, that i'm like i don't want to mess it up i gotta wait till my skills are worthy of of this sculpt to do but uh yeah. that's funny that's the, the caesar is also one that you know if you're handy with a razor saw, you could section it, put magnets mm -hmm. in at the waist, and then you could torso mm -hmm. twist with it. <laughs> yeah, Get, getting the waist magnets is is a, is a tricky one on the metal one for sure. But uh, we'll, we'll uh, maybe. Well, some of the designs, the parts hang down over the mm -hmm. the waist area. Yeah. Or you can't get at them. Yeah. To uh, modify them that way, but. Mm -hmm. Lets it up. Um, kind of taking a step back, then you know about kind of the you know, the battle tech outside of the sculpting and kind of creating that universe, you know, um, you know, your, your novels are, are beloved by the fan base, you know, and I, I know Wolves on the Border is, is, you know, my personal favorite and the favorite of many others, you know, and so I'm really, really interested in kind of what, you know, you know, what brought you into, to getting, writing those novels and what the process was like between what I imagine based on the publishing dates that it seemed like kind of almost like a four way collaborative process between you and and William H. Keith and Michael Stackpole and, and Robert Thurston, you know, because those novels really blend together extremely well. And so I don't know if that was kind of by happenstance from a really good outline that that Fossa gave you or if you guys were really interactive in that process to to create that early universe. It's complicated. Okay, well, let's, let's dive <laughs> right, in. A, let's dive in. I know a, everyone a, listening a, wants to hear. Answer, right. Um, <laughs> The, um, there's several parts to your question, so I'm, I, I'm going to have to address them in several parts. Right? Uh, I'll start with how I got involved, if that works for you. Definitely. Um, like I said, everything's connected. You know, I had been running role-playing games, game mastering, mm -hmm. and was getting progressively more and more frustrated that the players would never manage to actually organize themselves in such a way that we would get to a, uh, a satisfying conclusion of something, right? You know, they follow along for a while and then they all, you know, usually wander off right when they're supposed to be having the climactic encounter. Mm -hmm. um, and because of the way I was creating the adventures and the increasing amount of, uh, you know, character interaction that was happening in our games. You know, it was a little bit like, you know, working out the whole story and as if it were a novel, you know, with characters and character interaction and then never getting to the conclusion. It was very frustrating. So, you know, I conceived the idea that, that maybe I should just write a, a book. Maybe that would be a better way for me to, to get out the uh, uh, creative interest that I had in these stories. So I approached Jordan Weissman at a convention. Uh, this was early on. I think Thunder Rift was already out. Okay. And uh, said, so you guys are doing novels now, you know? Um, you know, you, are, are you, uh, are you look, looking for, for folks to, uh, to write for you? And he's like, who wants to know? <laughs> I said, well, I thought I might. And he yeah. said, yes. <laughs> um, and uh, I obviously hadn't written one at that point, right? Mm -hmm. So I had no credentials. Um, but they were looking for someone to write the story of the Dragoons leaving the Draconis Combine. Okay. 
And since it involved the Dragonus Combine, you remember back when I said mm -hmm. Jordan approached me about things Shido. for Bushido? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, he figured that I, in my, you know, the work I had done in researching Japan for Bushido mm -hmm. uh, made me, of the people they knew, uh, uniquely qualified to handle Cretan stuff. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I approach, I put together a short pricey of how I thought the novel would go and sent it to them and they approved that. And I said, you know, go forth and do it. Yeah. You know, you know, and you know, pretty much the only thing they, they asked about was it's the story of the Dragoons leaving the Combine. Okay. And That's, most yeah. of the rest was left to me. <laughs> wow. Um, I had also put together a, a short sample uh, featuring um, the Black Widow Company because, you know, that was out. So there was material to look at mm -hmm. to, to see with the Dragoons and, you know, so based on the, the fiction elements that were in there, you know, I'd wrote, I wrote it a certain way and uh, turned it in. And I got told, uh, we don't want, we don't want Natasha to swear in Russian. <laughs> <laughs> you know, too cliched. Yeah. Okay. And it's like, okay, but she's swearing in Russian and the thing you just put out. Right. <laughs> uh, but that should give you some idea of how fast things were changing in the, the battle tech universe. Yeah. You know, much like in the original game, you know, the, the mechs were handed down, you know, most of them weren't being made anymore. Right. You know, they were scavenged from the battlefield. And then the first tech readout came out and every single mech was being built somewhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> every single one. Yeah. <laughs> Which is <Yep>. like, uh. <laughs> yeah, we explored that when I was talking with Michael and just kind of, you know, you know, talking about those early days where it was kind of that more dystopian kind of, you know, of future and, uh, and then kind of the uh, imagining the, the need to actually have a, um, a profitable business kind of uh, helping them to realize that that probably wasn't the best idea that there needed to be some kind of forward momentum in the universe to, uh, to kind of, uh, you know, encourage more products and more sales. Well, it, it, you know, the, the idea that the, the tech was getting worse was Jordan's. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, it was one of his, you know, big twist concept mm -hmm. ideas. And unfortunately that's kind of twist that plays against the need mm -hmm. of a commercial product. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and then, you know, uh, there was the, the great death legion stories where they find the, the knowledge core. Right. And among the, the first novels yeah yeah <laughs> <And> suddenly, <laughs> even more stuff is available yeah and had um you said that um the first decision at thunder rift had come out um you know beforehand did um where was your writing kind of timed with the release of, of like mercenary star and price of glory where they were you know talking about that how memory core and that release and yeah, or, or were you right? Were you and, and was Stackpole writing the war, Warrior trilogy at the same time you were writing Wolves on the Border, or was there some kind of you know stacking or progression there? Um, I, I, we were. I think we were writing them separately at the same time. Okay. Uh, there was a conference held in Chicago that we both attended, as well as some other folks who, you know, besides the the uh, on staff Vasa team. There were some other folks there, and I'm a little fuzzy on who they all were, because you know I walked into that conference, you know, not knowing anybody but Jordan and Ross, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and you know, full disclosure, I'm an, I'm an introvert, so you know, it's uh, always a challenge for me to walk into a room full of strangers, mm -hmm. uh, and. You know, sitting there and taking that all in. And then about the same time, they decided they had another assignment for me and they wanted me to do the, the Ted Carita story, as Jordan raised it. I say, okay, well, 
You know, I'm going to need to know what's going on. You know, has anybody used Theodore? And Mike put his hand up and said, yeah, yeah, I used him in a scene. Okay, what sort of scene? Oh, yeah, well, you know, he's, he's in this uh, staff meeting and he pulls out a gun and shoots a general. <laughs> okay. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's uh, somewhat okay. character defining there. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I have to write about a homicidal maniac. That, that was not in my mind. <laughs> and in the course of the weekend, Mike also later remembered he used him in another scene where, not to put too fine a point on it, Theodore pulled out a gun and shot somebody <laughs> <laughs> uh, as a way to end the conversation, right? Yeah. And it's like, definitely a homicidal maniac. Mm -hmm. This is not the kind of character I want to write. So I was able to read those two scenes before I finished my book. And I actually rewrote both of those scenes from Theodore's point of view. Mm -hmm. All the dialogue is identical. Yeah. But it's a very different spin yeah. on what Mike had right. positioned it as. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, part, of, part of it was my desire to have a more likable central mm -hmm. character for the story. Yeah. Uh, someone who wasn't a homicidal maniac. Uh, and part of it also was I was watching what was happening in some of the other books in the Caritan appear uh, appearances. Mm -hmm. And they were more and more portrayed as basically a yellow peril menace that was, you know, no redeeming qualities. <laughs> right. And that is a terrible representation of the Japanese character. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a terrible representation to put in a, uh, a game. Um, and it just it doesn't make a good story. <laughs> well, I think, you know, the, those most familiar with Baltic, everyone tries to assign the houses to a nationality and tries to frame the good guys and bad guys. And, and, you know, you know, certainly in the, in the fan groups uh, on Facebook or whatnot, people are very quick to point out that there are, there are no good guys, right. They all have their, their redeeming qualities and their, their deep faults, you know? And so that's, I, that's awesome kind of hearing you talk about that and recognizing the danger that the universe had kind of heading toward that trope you know, and kind of pulling him back from the edge and being like, no, there are, there's no clear, there's no good, bad guy, or there's no good guy, there's no bad guy. You know, every, these are big, big, you know, not even nations. I mean, you're talking about star empires. And so right. the amount of nuance and the amount of different kind of personalities within there is, is vast. Um, and the, I mean, that's contributed a lot to, to the universe is, is having that, that character. The early stuff was heading that way. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, Small as, small as it was in terms of book count, you mm -hmm. know, part of my mission was to put some, somewhat of a break on that. Yeah. Uh, well, it's, um, well, just from hearing you, you know, this, this sounds remarkable because it's, it, it's seeming that you guys had very little interaction along the way. And kind of, as I noted before, of kind of how, how well these, these novels fit together, you know, between, and granted at the, um, you know, William, uh, William Keith's novels, you know, are kind of separate, you know, they have kind of their own events happening, but, but the events that are happening in Wolves um, and Air and, and the Warrior Trilogy and then, and then later, um, you know, with, um, with Lethal Hell, sorry, the Blood of Kerensky Trilogy plus your Wolf Pack, you know, there's, there's a lot of cohesion between these novels. And it's just, it's, it's surprising for me to, to hear you say that you guys were kind of just given this very bare bones outline and kind of were able to go and kind of come out with this project. So was there, was there some kind of, you know, editing at the end where people came back and kind of had to make sure they fit together well in a puzzle or did it just happen to, to fall very well, you know, together because you guys were, I guess, ultimately drawing from the same source books. Yeah. Well, one thing you got to keep in mind that this was pretty much the early days of the multimedia approach to games. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, Dungeons and Dragons had 
done some novels uh, successfully. Um, and you know, Fawcett was just dipping its toes in the water here. You know, they published a decision at Thunder Rift uh, with no, no idea whether it would be successful or not. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and um, Bill Keefe tried to explain some of the, weir the weirdnesses of the game. You know, things like the auto cannons carrying 12 rounds. Right. Right. You know, so he made up the whole cassette ammunition thing. Okay. It's 12 cassettes of multiple rounds. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, not everybody followed that right away. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you can read a lot of Battletech novels and it's like, okay, they transcribed their games. Yeah. And that was never something I liked. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I can recall Michael mentioning when he was talking to you about how I uh, ripped him a new one about that sort of thing. Yeah. Where <laughs> uh, I was not targeting that at him, actually. He, he was doing a, a halfway decent job of, of not doing that. But some of the battles did get a little, yeah, I'm watching a game. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that's good fiction. No. Yeah. And that's what I was trying to communicate to him uh, because I'd seen people do far worse than him yeah. at that. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, it was an evolving process, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, you know, the, the, the brief had, uh, you know, the technology other than the fusion reactors and the, the energy weapons, right? basically World War II level technology. Okay. So, you know, I had, okay, that's the brief. Okay, we'll, we'll run with that. You know, no satellites is why it was a big deal when I gave Wolf Stragoon the satellite as part of the explanation of why they could do things other people couldn't do. Um, I wrote a scene with an aerospace pilot pulling high Gs and I basically wrote him wearing the equivalent of a late World War II pressure suit, which used water to keep the blood flowing by pumping it around the thing. And I just, oh, no, no, that's too high tech. Okay. You know, but I, I did my research, you know, mm. and it's World War II tech. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, can't have that. Okay. Yeah. You can, um, you can jump from star system to star system, but you can't pump water in your, in your, uh, your, in your jumpsuit. Suit. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there were some things like that. Um, one of the interesting things of working with uh, people is people bring a lot of different things to it. Right. Um, and Fossa had an in-house editor at that time uh, who, um, it really wasn't into this military stuff. Had a very much other interest. And uh, she was very good, I think, for a lot of the game writers, but uh, didn't, didn't always listen to her writers. I mean, she caught me making some mistakes, very clean. Yeah. But we had a go around, for example, about samovars. She was insisting that samovars are only used for coffee. Okay. And I had written a scene where the samovar was used to make tea, right? Because Karit, you, you, funny thing you mentioned about the, the nationalities. Mm -hmm. um, I had a conversation with Sam Lewis early on. And yes, indeed, there were basically two nationalities that were smushed together for each of the houses. Mm -hmm. And Karita was... Japan and Russia. So I put a samovar in to mm. make the tea. You know, the Japanese don't use them, but the Russians do. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I did my research to find out about Russian samovars, mm -hmm. and the editor insisted I was wrong. Yeah, you so you win lose some, you lose some. Oh, yeah, definitely. Well, you know, taking, talking specifically more about kind of Wolves on the Border. And so Wolves on the Border is your first novel, not just yeah. your first Battletech novel, your first novel. Yes. 
So, you know, and, you know, obviously you'd put a lot of time into passion into Bushido, you know, and that this is, you know, seems like it was kind of an outlet for you to kind of finally express that, you know, in, in, a, in a cohesive story. And so what uh, I'm always kind of curious, you know, for, for writers, if they, if they kind of write the character and they let the kind of the story kind of evolve with it, or if you had a framework for, for kind of what was happening in the story and kind of thematic elements that you wanted to bring to and then fill in kind of the, the story around it, kind of which, which kind of approach, if, if either of those, you know, did, did you prefer and kind of how did that come to create Wolves on the Border, you know, as the novel? Well, um, obviously different writers work different ways. Mm -hmm. That's always going to be a truism. Um, you know, uh, for Wolves on the Border, I mean, obviously, my memories of Wolves on the Border, because it was the first one, in some ways are a lot stronger than later works. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I had previously done a lot of work into to Japanese culture, and clearly the, the book was focused more heavily on the, that than the Russian culture. Um, and, you know, I had the House Korea source book to look at, and, you know, flipping through it, looking for inspiration, you know, trying to find things that could play into this, you know, finding out who was in charge of where the dragoons were and, you know, where, where they were supposed to be stationed. Those things were all set out. Mm -hmm. um, some hints of the characters of some of the, the uh, personalities were in the early... Uh, gaming materials, you know, the Black Widow's source book, uh, adventure book, you know, introduced her company, you know, right. they all had short write-ups at the very least, mm -hmm. you know, they expressed a certain kind of character in the little fiction bits, you know, we got bits of that about J.B. Wolf, who I'm pretty sure when originally named may have supposed to have been Jaime Wolf, given okay. the way it's spelled. Yeah, <laughs> interesting. Uh, but everyone always called him Jamie. Okay. Um, so I went with that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, flipping through the book, there was this one illustration, I think Jim Holloway did it, of a black samurai mm -hmm. painting pottery. And I said, I'm, I want to write about that guy. Right? Because here's a black guy that has embraced the culture he's living in, right? He's not black, he's Cretan. Uh, he just happens to have black skin. Right. Um, and, you know, again, that was part of the, let's not do all stereotypes here. Well, that's, that's interesting because it, it hadn't even occurred to me, but I can't recall any, any hint of, of racism in Battletech. It, it was all about house and loyalty there. I don't remember any, oh, but maybe I'm remembering wrong. The Capella Confederation. Okay. Oh, good God. Yeah. They, they, were, they were even worse yellow peril than the Caritans. Fair. You know, they were cast as the bad guys and they were, you know. Well, I guess with, within the universe, you know, within the universe, not, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. You know, in, the, in all those first stories, mm -hmm. and, and the, the first, one of the things that happens in, in franchises, particularly gaming franchises, the material that comes out first sets expectations, mm -hmm. right? People didn't understand it back then, but I've watched it develop in Battletech. I mean, Davion became the heroes, mm -hmm. right? They had one of the first source books, and they were against Karita in the first in one of the first source books, right? Yeah. So it was that feud and, and that was the go-to place, right? And then they cooked up the, well, we're going to have Steiner aligned with Davion. So that became the good guy axis. Right. Right? And the, uh, the you know, the evil axis of, nastiness you know who are the bad guys and do terrible things all the time as opposed to our our good upstanding heroes who also all happen to be white 
Yeah. Well, well, certainly as the universe evolved, you know, they weren't all, <laughs> they weren't all good doing good things all the time. No, so. but, but yeah, see, that was a pullback from mm -hmm. that. Yeah. They began to recognize it was going that way. Right. But the last, you know, like I said, I, I talked with Sam about, you know, you know, what some of these, some of these inspirations were. And, um, you know, you go back and you, you look at the house books and you look at the various forces they have. What are the two house books that have assassins? Caridon and Caridon. Capellans. Yeah. Well, the, uh, you know, unfortunately the, uh, the assassins started coming later with, uh, you know, Davion between poor old Melissa, but, uh, but yeah, the, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I, I see, I see what you're saying now, you know, I was kind of thinking more in terms of the kind of, uh, you know, the, the black, white, you know, kind of in universe, I've never heard the novels kind of, you know, call out that, but I, I definitely see kind of the, the nationality, kind of, uh, kind of the, the reflection of the political environment uh, uh, at the time. Um, interesting that, you know, is kind of using the Japanese instead of the Russian element of it, since the Russian was definitely kind of the, the real world kind of opposition at that time. But, um, uh -huh. but I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to pull too far off that Wolfpack because I, you know, I definitely enjoy kind of hearing this origin story of, of, sorry, of wolves on the border and kind of, you know, how you're kind of coming through that. And so you, sure. you've got this idea of Minobo through uh, Jim Holloway's illustration and kind of, um, and, um, yeah, and just kind of, you know, how that evolved into the story. And it just, for me, you know, the, the complexity of the politics, you know, and, you know, kind of the, or I'll take a step back. And one of the things that, that I enjoyed the most, and, and um, Text Talks does some uh, wonderful battle tech videos. I don't know if you've caught them, but they talk about the history. And, and it's, he had done one where he was talking about, you know, why the, the inner sphere kind of stepped back into that feudal environment, you know, as related to basically the ability to travel and communicate, you know, and for me, um, that really clicked. And I hadn't kind of put that together through my own, own understanding of history and readings of history to that point of, of why that was appropriate for the time and why kind of back, you know, in the Middle Ages that that, that a, a democracy in the modern sense wouldn't have it you want it to work because there's not enough instant communication. You know, you're talking about weeks, months, maybe a year to, mm -hmm. to get from one side of a, a kingdom to another um, or an empire to another. And that in the inner sphere, it essentially kind of went back to that because of its expansive nature. Um, and so, um, so yeah, and just that, just that, that, you know, the fact that within the curator and the wolves on the border, you know, have, um, you know, you have your kind of renegade, you know, general that's, that's acting and, and you have, you know, uh, Takashi Kurita that has to, that can't just expunge his generals for doing things that aren't what he wants, but he's definitely not happy you know, with those mm -hmm. decisions that are being made. And it, that was just a very fun dynamic for me. And, and, and I, I really enjoyed it, you know, more kind of coming back and reading as an adult, because the first time I read this, I was 14, 15. And so the, the themes that I pulled out of that were were honor and duty and loyalty, you know, themes that kind of, you know, I embraced kind of at that, at that point in my life. And now kind of reading back of looking at just the complexity of leadership, you know, and, and management, you know, um, also kind of ring back to me. And so I really enjoy that, you know, about the novel. And I enjoyed how, you know, how you dealt with kind of, you know, the, the challenges and the conflicts that arise because, you know, people are people and they, and they're kind of, you know, they do what's in their own best interest, but, uh, but yeah, and um, how you kind of evolved the story from that. Well, you know, a significant part of that is a very, very Japanese cultural thing, particularly in the samurai culture. Mm -hmm. the, the conflict between Giri, duty, and Gimi, human feelings. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a classic conflict in Japanese literature and art. You know, the struggle between doing what's right and proper and what, you know, you're required to do by society. And the fact that you're a human being with emotions yeah. that are at war with this. And, you know, that's one of the, one of the, the uh, subtle, subtle but on plain view, if you know enough uh, of the issues, it's, it's, un, it's unresolved at the end of the novel. Yeah. As it is in life, always, you know, well, <laughs> unresolved but, on some you level. Know, I, I'm, there are always new readings coming up. You know, so one hesitates to 
spoil the ending as yeah. even now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, it's not doing it. But that was a that was a radical ending for the time mm-hmm. for uh, uh, an American book. Uh, it's how I knew the story had to go, but it's not what I originally pitched to them because I didn't think they'd accept it. But after the book, you know, the, the, uh, uh, an early version of the, the, the book went in, Jordan said, you know, Minobu really needs to end it the way it, it does. Mm-hmm. And I said, okay, because that was a story that as it should have been. Yeah. But even then, the ritual at the end has a lot of significances in it. You know, when we, in America anyway, mostly only see the broad brushes of it. And partially because it, you know, it it titillates us uh, that a culture could be so committed to that kind of thing. Mm. Um, But it's usually I don't know. I mean, do you want me to spoil it? I mean, I, no. I can put names I'm, to, to I can I can put a spoiler warning on the video. I can say spoiler <laughs> coming up and people can skip forward and I'll put a okay. bookmark that'll let them Because it'll it, make so. it much easier to talk about this. Yeah, <laughs> let's do it. All right, so spoiler warning, everyone. And I'll, I'll put a timestamp here for you. Skip to that this point in the video. And uh, Okay. Yeah. Well, it's about seppuku, right? The ritual <laughs> suicide. And Manobu eventually is put in a position where that's the answer. And, you know, that was the bit that wasn't originally in the the first draft, but should have been. And uh, when he commits a puku, there's a particular part of the ritual about where he wraps the rice paper on the blade. Um, You know, it's normally done right at the hilt, but he wraps it above the hilt. And that's a message that despite the fact that he's doing this to atone and that it should restore his honor, wrapping it where he wrapped it indicates that he does not consider it sufficient. That's good. The nuances, yeah. Right, and Mm -hmm. that says something about the whole situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, um, the, the like I said, things were things were really done by bootstraps mm-hmm. in the very early years. Yeah, right. Um, I got a warning that the dragoons came from elsewhere because you know it was a big mystery originally. They okay. deliberately planted a lot of seeds where they didn't have answers. Okay. Right. Well, that, that was going to be a, a follow-up question. When, when in your process did you get that that could be from elsewhere? No. Remember, 40, 40 years ago. You know, it's a, some of it's a little yeah. vague. Okay. <laughs> but um, I deliberately started laying um, hints that they had a culture that was not obvious. Okay. Right. Um, well, cer- certainly in the... I forget which novel it is, but the scene, the scene where um, the scene where they're talking and they they decide to uh, break the contract and recall everybody, um, and the the first clan word is spoken, and my memory is is faded on this and what it is. So, and I don't know if if you're knowing what I'm talking about, you can kind of help guide me to to my point. But well, I mean, there are a couple of words I used that became clan words. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, at least one of those, there was no clan when I put it in there. And it became a clan word when the clans started to be solidified. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a conference in Chicago where, you know, they, they had, the FASA team had decided that the clans were coming and there was going to be a trilogy bringing that in. Mm-hmm. And, uh, um, you know, they wanted one about how, you know, well, Shagoons was going to handle that since it turns out that they were from the clans. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So a lot of things that I wrote, I had to adapt to some of their new concepts uh, and you know, put my own stamp on it. Yeah. You, know, you can't have writers writing without them trying to put their own stamp on of things. Of course. <laughs> whatnot, you know? And in Battletech, you know, everybody's got to have a mech, right? <laughs> you got to have your own mech. <laughs> Uh, but uh, um, and was that was that after the publication of Wolves or or somewhere between you writing it and it getting published? And... Wolves, Wolves on the Border was published before there were clans. Yeah, yeah, and so that this was around the time of uh, of Wolfpack. You know, was that or was uh, Wolf, it? Have, Wolfpack, I guess, an heir of the dragon. Wolfpack wasn't written until after that conference. Okay, you know, because I knew there were going to be clans. I knew some of what they were. Mm -hmm. But again, for the most part, I was waiting, you know, I read Thurston's first book when I got sent a copy of it, you know, there was no advance on it. Mm -hmm. You know, we were told several things that this is the plan, this is what we want to do. You know, the, the first appearance of the clan, you're not even sure they're human. Right. Right. The mechs look different. They've got the, the elementals. Um, I don't, I'm not even sure they were called elementals then. They may have just, you know, battle-suited infantry. Yeah. Uh, and I know the publication order, but in terms of the order that they were written, did, did Thurston's, did Wave of the Clans come before Lethal Heritage in terms of introducing the clans, or was Lethal Heritage the... I'd, I'd have to go... <laughs> well, I can't <laughs> dig them out anymore. Michael sold a lot of my copies. But yeah. you know, I'd have to look at the copyright dates myself. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, because I know we, it was happening very close. I mean, it was kind of like bap, 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 you know, in terms of yeah, the novels. Yeah, you know, we, we, didn't, we didn't communicate so much directly then. Okay. We didn't have the, the kind of writer's retreats the same way mm -hmm. that they have over the years. There were more of these, okay, you are the guys who are working on this project with us. Here's what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. Go forth and make it happen. Kind of approach. Um, you know, like I mentioned rewriting from Theodore's point of view mm -hmm. a couple of scenes and one of them was where he sh you know sh shoots a certain character and Mike had written it that you know and the scene ends in black right you know mm -hmm. the gunshot goes off black screen you know classic uh, TV kind of thing right yeah well he later thanked me for not killing that character. Oh, for good, for a good reason. Yes, for those. Because <laughs> he, he brought him back yes. and made him prominent yes. in uh, the storyline he was doing. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that wasn't in his original plans, but it right. was something I did. So we were clearly reading each other's books yeah. and, you know, working with them and, mm -hmm. and around them. Occasionally trying to rewrite them if, if it wasn't quite what we wanted. Yeah. Um, certainly when I did that, I was always motivated, not so much to, you know, well, you know, F you, it really should have been this way. Mm -hmm. But okay, I want to make it a better story, at least a better story to me. Yeah. Well, that's that's an awesome revelation there. You know, the, the fandom can know who... Uh, you know, where that, that favorite character, uh, you know, owes his uh, sort of origin to, his rebirth, I guess, <laughs> and, uh, and, and consequently the rest of the inner sphere owes a, owes a debt of gratitude to that decision from you. Um, but uh, very cool. That's a cool little tidbit there. Um, well, I, I certainly felt that that character at that point certainly had earned, uh, earned the, the right to spend the rest of his life in a closed cell with no one else around <laughs> yeah yeah that's redemption right it's a you know everyone's favorite favorite uh story arc you know mm -hmm. from from vader to for, to all others um what um you know kind of coming back there was there's certainly a big break between wolf pack and the initiation to war in a very different time in the kind of the battletech universe you know what what was kind of different about that process for you of kind of coming back or what inspired you to come back and write for battletech and and how is it different kind of writing now where there's an expansively defined universe that you have to write within versus basically you're you're creating it as you go well i, I think you're asking me about the the jump between wolfpack and initiation to war yeah yeah, yeah. um Obviously, I had been away for a while. 
mm -hmm. uh, at that point. Things had very much progressed. Uh, I was not a big fan of what the clans did to the game as a gamer. Um, uh, you know, and much of that arise, arises from being a gamer, okay? You know, I loved Battletech. I loved the fact that you could play a company. And in the early days, if you played it enough, you didn't even need the sheets. You knew what all the numbers were. Yeah. So you could play the game, not the numbers. Right. And then, you know, all the new tech, you know, all the, you know, you know, all the variants and the lasers and stuff. And it was just too much to keep track of. And, you know, you couldn't run a company anymore. Um, at least I couldn't. <laughs> um, so for, you know, brief period, I was still playing it and make a point of not running clan mechs most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, take a perverse pride in taking clan mechs down with tanks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I didn't, didn't like what it was doing. I, I thought there was so much more material could have been done with what was set up that never got touched. Um, but the universe went in another direction. Um, I was also being distracted by other things right. because um, I worked with Fossiter to design Shadowrun. And uh, part, of, part of my contract to be lead designer on that included that I got to write the first trilogy. Yeah. <laughs> so... Uh, you know, and that was an opportunity for me to set a tone uh, to the universe. And, uh, you know, much like I still hearing things like, you know, you know, you wrote the best standalone battle tech novel kind of thing. I get, you know, oh, you wrote the good Shadow Run books. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, I will. Uh, I'll put them on my reading list. Uh, it's, uh, I'll pick up the, tri the trilogy, even though I haven't played Shadowrun. Yeah. But uh, I would, I'd love to read some more of your more of your work there. What um, <laughs> you know, I I still want to kind of get back to the difference in how you came back to Initiation to War. But before I forget, you you talked about the untold stories, and that plays into a question I had for later. It's like what what is a story that you wanted to tell in BattleTech that you never got a chance to? Well, I probably would have followed on from, you know, the Dragoons having their own planet. Mm -hmm. um, some of the, the Caritan characters that I had written, you know, I, I brought them back in various ways. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think some of them had more stories to tell. Um, part of the way I work is, it, you know, the, it can start in various places. Um, it might be the inspiration of seeing the picture that became Minobu mm -hmm. uh, from Wolves on the Border in the, the source book. Or it might be, you know, this would be a neat thing to do, you know, to have happen to deal with this kind of circumstance. Uh, a lot of different ways uh, that things could have gone. Um, I mean, I actually sent one of my characters off who, who became the bounty hunter back when there was a bounty hunter, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the whole Dread Pirates Robert version of that was mine. Yeah. Right? Because you, you can do things with that. Mm -hmm. Right? You know, you can, you can have the man in black come back and save the Princess Bride, but you can do other things with it too. You know, it's, it's Captain Blood, right? Which is not exactly a new novel. Yeah. And, you know, most, most people know it from the movie. But, you know, a guy goes off and becomes a pirate, right? Yeah. Right? But, you know, that's not his real name. But, you know, he doesn't, you know, the, the honorable bounty hunter is a thing. Uh, seen a show called The Mandalorian? Yeah. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. He's wearing Mandalorian armor. He could be anybody. Yeah. Right? So there's there's an element of it in there, you know? Um, I didn't have a specific story that I wanted to write um, in between there because of course I was working on Shadowrun. Okay. 
which kind of occupied everything. And uh, the universe kept changing and getting further and further away. So, you know, that's why I went out to the periphery. Yeah. Where I didn't have to worry about the 50 million different political things that were happening in the inner sphere. Some of which was like, oh, crap, I don't want to deal with that. <laughs> Well, if, uh, if nobody has planted the seed in your head, uh, you know, let me do it. But, you know, they have the shrapnel episode, our issues that are coming out, the compilation of short stories that cover all the errors. And so if you have an itch to write for some more, any of those stories, those untold stories, you know, well, uh, people would love to see, you know, the next shrapnel have a, a Robert Shrett short story based in whatever time period, whatever time period it inspires you <laughs> and you want to kind of cover. Well, it, it's, it's come to my attention that that has happened. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Battletech having survived this long, that's something that can happen now. Yeah. Right. Um, and um, they, uh, the whole idea that there are places you can write in those niches and fill, the, fill in the stories mm -hmm. is a great thing for the universe, I think. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I want to go there now. Yeah. You know? Uh, That's a, life has moved on. I, I get that. Yeah. yeah well, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, Michael told you that, you know, Battletech was a very small part of my life. Um, and it's like, yeah, it may have occupied a small number of years, but. It was impactful. I yeah. I kind of have a lot of interests, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you, can certainly tell by telling you what my degree was. And, you know, I obviously haven't uh, made a career of that. And I've gone off and done other things. But I haven't, my interest hasn't completely gone away. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I, w I went out with. Um, the Mech Warrior book to be out in the periphery just to you know get closer to the stuff I was familiar with without having to do the the backlog. I mean, I just I have trouble imagining how someone can keep track of all this stuff these days without devoting their life to it. There's just so much material. Well, I I had mentioned that in my last podcast actually, just how you know my gaming is. I game primarily in 3025 and I, you know, I may kind of play in 3050, but I don't put 3050 on the table that much just because that's my capacity. You know, I don't have the capacity sure. to, you know, I have these people that can game in any era. I have immense respect. There's a lot of fun, a lot of cool things you do, but I'm like, all right, I can, I'm going to focus on this era. You know, <laughs> there's, there's plenty to focus on and maybe when I exhaust it, I can move on to the next, but. Uh, well, but yeah, see, that's... now you're just expressing the attitude that I was talking about with yeah. regard to what was happening in the universe yeah, for yeah. me. Definitely. Right. Yep. It, you know, it's, it was, it was too much and there were things undone. Um, but, you know, I've written for FASA and its successors what I've been asked. Um, you know, when they did the, uh, was it the, the big anniversary volume? Was it the 25th fourth? anniversary? Yeah. Yeah, yeah the hardback one. Mm -hmm. You know, they got in touch with me and said, Would you like to write a story? Mm hmm. And uh, so I did, and I actually took advantage of there could be any error thing. And I reused one of my characters. I never mentioned his name, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the savvy reader will know. Character is not someone you haven't seen before. Yeah. Just pay attention to the physical description and you'll know who it is. Mm -hmm. Assuming you've read the stuff I've written. Yeah. What you can never I, do. I haven't gone to Initiation of War yet, but I, I did read the uh, the short story in, in 25 years. I'm sorry, say again, please. I said I haven't gone to Initiation of War yet in my uh, my chronology. I got up to I Am Jade Falcon as a teen, and I've been rereading once I picked it back up, and I'm up to Blood of Heroes now. So I just got a ways to go uh, to get to Initiation of War, but I did I did kind of check out. Yeah, well, if you're reading short. everything in order, there's a lot to read. Yes. <laughs> yes. A lot to read. Yeah, we may we may skip the dark ages so I can skip ahead to the current stuff once I get there. But uh, yeah. and every every time something new comes out that isn't 
isn't at the end of the timeline, I'm excited. Like, you know, Michael had written, a, you know, his uh, Origin of the Kelhounds, you know, which is the book I'm reading right now. So it was nice to be able to say, okay, I can read a new book because it's set back here and it's not going to spoil anything yeah. um, in that universe. Is there a kind of back to, that's a novel question. Is there, is there any book that you read that, you know, kind of, kind of was a favorite for you, you know, that wasn't yours or, or a scene in another book that really kind of stood out as kind of a favorite scene, you well, know, either in the earlier or later novels? Ah, oh, wow. There's so many I haven't read, oh. <laughs> you know, so. The, well, we'll uh, make it easy. We'll make it easy on, we'll, you can stick to the ones you have read. We won't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, most of those are really old. Mm -hmm. um, Michael brought by a couple he thought I would be interested in because they involved Wolf's Dragoons. Mm -hmm. So those are actually the most recent ones I've read. Uh, and, yeah, you might have got the sense that I'm something of a nitpicker mm -hmm. about writing. Uh, I'm a writer. I'm a fussy writer. And, um, the... Uh, because it's recent to me, um, I suppose, oh, God, what was it called? Um, it was also an author that is relatively recent to the canon. Okay. Um, maybe Schweitzer? Redemption kind of Rift, maybe? Okay. I think that's... Check. I haven't, I haven't read They gave me one, Rift, one by Blaine and... Uh, one by the fellow whose name I didn't know at the time mm -hmm. and now can't remember. Yeah. Uh, too many names, not enough brain cells. Yeah. Um, but it was, it, it was uh, starring the Dragoons and went back very heavily into history. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, these the characters were busy spending a lot of their time thinking about things that had happened a hundred years ago instead of things that had happened in their lifetimes, mm -hmm. uh, which was an odd sort of thing, but charming in a, in a way. I think that's part of why Michael recommended it to me because it touched on a lot of the stuff I had written. Yeah. And, but I was particularly struck by how well that author managed to write the battles without it making sound like a game awesome turn by turn mm -hmm. you know he had a really wide vocabulary repertoire for the various weapons going off and mm -hmm. and what they did to machines and i always found that a struggle to try to not have it always sound the same yeah but you know he also has the benefit of you know, decades of people trying to write this stuff and yeah. come up with different ways to <laughs> say it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, you know, I certainly enjoyed that, that uh, part of it. It was long and intricate novel. Um, he brought me these, these two and Blaine's was quite short mm -hmm. and it actually had larger typeface. So the, the words were bigger. Yeah. And a smaller typeface for the other one. So, you know, it's like, despite the fact the page count may have been about twice, it was really like three or four 30. times as much material <laughs> in it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Lord knows I'm guilty enough of, uh, you know, letting books go on to try to fit everything in. Wolfpack is not a small book. No, no. Um, it just kept, you know, kept being more to say in the story. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a uncomplicated story. Right. I don't think I don't think any of your uh, your novels can claim to be uncomplicated. And Heir to the Dragon, <laughs> I mean, the the epic nature of Heir to the Dragon is it kind of stands out for me. Um, you know, as as kind of fun thing, and, and just kind of reading it and kind of realizing the ride that you're going on as as it was going. I remember you know kind of rereading it uh, earlier this year. I was like, whoa, all right, we're in a totally different time frame, time era. All right, let's do it. Let's what's happening here. It was, yeah. it was a fun one. Well, that was, that was a, a challenge. You know, they wanted yeah. the Ted Carita story. Yeah. You know, they basically wanted a biography of the guy as a novel. Right. And that means you've got to cover a lifetime. Yeah. Well, and, and it's impressive too, because it was such, it was such a different structure than Wolves on the Border was, you know, um, you know, and, and brain making it that kind of that epic, uh, you know, that odyssey, you know, if you were kind of, 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 of Teddy Curita, but it was fun. Well, you know, I was, I was learning the trade to, mm -hmm. to write novels. So I was 
certain amount of experimentation going on. Yeah. You know, Wolves was, was the first one, very conventional. And mm -hmm. it, sorry, it's relatively compact in time. Um, but um, Heir to the Dragon had to be much broader in time frame in order to tell a complete story and, you know, reach a conclusion where, you know, the, the protagonist could come out on top, but not necessarily conclude everything for, you know, the House of Corita and the Draconis Combine. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Wolfpack, I experimented in another way uh, in that it's basically being told as a reminisce. Hmm. And some of the chapters are told in the first person. And the ones where that character isn't present, they're told in the third person, right. um, which is an exercise in learning how to write and, mm -hmm. and pay attention to to voice and uh, um, what characters should be able to know. You know, it, it, it's something that writers have to learn if they want to be considered good writers by most people. Yeah, you know. Yeah, you know, every once in a while you make mistakes. Um, uh, some of the, you know, Michael asked me to, to you know, critique his stuff. I said, "You sure you want me to do that?" You know, so he got what he asked for. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, I I did my best because you know he's just as self-taught as I am on in terms of writing. Yeah. And. Uh, the thing he didn't share that, that I told him over the course of his multi-book series is that he got better. Hmm. He got better at doing what he was trying to do. And hmm. that's important. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes it only comes from practice. But one of the things he missed was his characters would know things that they couldn't know. If that makes sense. Yeah. You know, well, there's, you know, they, there's the... they can't see their own expressions, for example. Hmm. Right. Um, and a lot of beginning writers miss that kind of thing. Right. They, they shift out of an, um, uh, a character viewpoint into an omniscient narrator and don't even know they're doing it because they don't know what those terms are. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I mean, when I, got started i i gobbled down a lot of writers digest how to how to be a writer books mm -hmm. to uh, understand some of the the mechanics of of writing not just running on what dribbles out of your head at any moment uh, well my michael's fortune you know one of my favorite quotes is that ben, i think it's ben franklin that you know our critics are our friends you know they show us our faults you know and so uh you know michael uh michael's had a you know a great <laughs> great friend in you to kind of help him help him through that process you know not too many people have uh you know have uh, uh mr robert charette you know guiding him through their their fan fiction writing but uh and it's certainly his like as he had kind of talked you know as uh he found that uh you know, the source book writing is, you know, where his skills lay, maybe not the narrative, uh, you know, and the source books are wonderful. I, you know, I've had a ton of fun reading those. But um, do, you, do you have a, do you have a favorite character that you enjoy writing for or a character you enjoy writing? Several. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, the, I, I enjoyed writing Jamie and Minobu. Mm -hmm. um, once I got a handle on it, I enjoyed writing theater. I, I really liked writing Takashi and, and uh, 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 I'm going to get the name wrong. The security head. Uh, Sub Hash. Yeah, yeah. Sub Hash, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I enjoyed writing him. Um, again, another, you know, current world national who was mm. Japanese, even though that wasn't his ethnic origin. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, you know, and favorite Shadowrun characters as well. Um, but, you know, to a large degree, the one you're living with had damn well better be your favorite. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because you're going to spend a lot of time with them. Definitely. Uh, okay. But, you know, you, you can play games um, with this stuff, you know. 
it was it was fun, you know, rewriting Mike Stackpole's scenes from the other side. Yeah. Uh, but I had to be scrupulous and keep the dialogue exactly the same. Um, uh, when I was writing Shadowrun books, uh, I had introduced another writer to Fasa. I recommended them that he write for them because they were looking for people who could write decent stuff. And uh, uh, we uh, both wrote scenes where we used one of the other guy's characters. And for those scenes, uh, you know, for example, in my book, I wrote the scene and told him what information needed to, to come out. And he wrote all the dialogue for his character. Oh, okay. And, and I like that. Reciprocity. Mm -hmm. He wrote the scene with one of my characters. I wrote all the dialogue. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Did you did you write it sequentially? Like, did it was like his line, your line, his line, your line, or no, was that too no, complicated? Not, okay. not quite that tight. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, it, I seemed to. It was probably a little back and forth about whether yeah. you know it, you know, doesn't have the right tone. But right. you know, we each knew our character better than the other character, mm -hmm. and they were important characters for us. Yeah. Uh, at the time, um, and I was I was writing for for Dodger the uh, the Alf Decker, who spoke in pseudo for Stooth as part of his public persona, uh, and he was writing for his uh, fixer, who may or may not have been a werewolf, <laughs> and. Uh, was heavily inspired by the uh, the other Blade Runner from Blade Runner. Okay. The one who left behind the origami. Yeah, um, Edward James, almost his character. Yeah, when he was young. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. That's, and uh, I will. Uh, I'll do what I can to get uh, someone over at Catalyst to reach out to you and ask you to write. If if asking yeah. if asking is the as a factor, then uh, then maybe you know. They can, uh, they can put out a request. No guarantees, you know. That's all right. That's life. No guarantees in life. But uh, yeah. if the mood strikes, the fan base would, would love to hear, you know, more of your stories for sure. Yeah. But, you know, I've, I've had a number of varied careers in a number of various areas. So, you know, I mean, the Shadowrun fandom, I think, feels much the same way as you and Michael uh, do about the Battletech stuff. Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, you know, would be happy to have me write more there. And, you know, I've got people who want me to sculpt more. Mm -hmm. You know, Michael even tried to find some way to convince me to sculpt another mech. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, I'm, uh, you know, my, my career base is in nonprofit as a nonprofit executive. So, uh, you know, I had to learn very early on that uh, if you don't ask, the answer will always be no. And if you do ask, the answer might be yes. So you got to ask. So I'll, uh, I'll sure. ask you <laughs> and, but, and be gracious if you say no. <laughs> but, uh, well, you know, always, you know, these guys are trying to run their business too. And yeah. they've got people coming to them asking to do stuff. Yeah. Right. And what's in front of you is always easier to deal with than what is out of sight. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Well, maybe we can uh, sell them on the fact that, you know, if they put Robert Shred's name on, on some fiction, it'll sell a little bit better than <laughs> maybe some, you know, some spring chicken out there coming that wants to write. Uh, but we'll I see. I, we'll see. So I, I have a totally inconsequential question for you. Please. Is that a Warhammer I see on your desk? Yeah, is that, that's one of those old uh, Maycross ones. Yeah, the six inch ones here. I'll go is, grab is it. Is it a plastic model or, or one yeah. of the? Yeah, it's a plastic. But there, you're back on ears. Oh, yeah, kind okay. of the macro size. But oh, okay. Almost one the, of the size of my head. Jointed ones, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then I got another kind of little plastic one that's about probably yeah. around the original size of, of what you were sculpting. Probably. Said, but yeah, those Pretty are both, uh, neither of those are Battletech products, but we won't tell anybody. Right. Well, you know, I also did a, the Warhammer for uh, Dark Horse's Robotech line, okay. which were larger sized ones, mm -hmm. and was able to make all of the, 
the destroids pivot at the waist because the pieces were big awesome. enough to do it. Yeah. And they allowed me to make multiple piece ones. Yeah. Well, let me, I'll, uh, let me sh show off one for you. You'll enjoy then. So this was the first miniature I ever uh, finished painting. Let's see if I can get a good good view there. And uh, that's supposed to be Natasha's. That's Natasha's, which is great for a beginner because it's just black with a bunch <laughs> of red lines, and it looks uh, it looks cool. But yeah. uh, got the decals on there as well. Um, so my only <laughs> the only skill I needed was I needed to make a really really straight line. <laughs> and, uh, that's, that's a serious skill it, it, it was it took some time but uh but yeah I, it's still one of my favorites and it's simple it's a uh, black primer with some white stripes on it but i did get the i did get the little uh you know the widow symbol kind of on that on that torso i thought it was yeah it's pretty good there. great it's a little hard to make out in the size resolution i've got here no but um yeah you know i, I saw the big one on the desk and mm. i had acquired a set it was a, a uh, you know, the, the jointed part was sort of an inner structure mm -hmm. and it had the different outer armor parts. So you could build it either as a warhammer or a mm -hmm. rifleman awesome. or a longbow. Yeah, yeah. Man, we didn't, we didn't even talk about the, uh, the Omnimex um, and kind of uh, creating the Omnimex in the uh, introduction. Yeah, maybe, well. Maybe we can, uh, you know what? I, Michael, keeps, Michael keeps insisting on calling those things prototypes. They're just kit bashes that I used, yeah. you know, and, you know, they weren't intended to, Ralph Parthur wasn't allowed to make the, the Omnimex. They got oh, somebody else to do the Omnimex who could work off the computer files. Interesting. Interesting. Because the Omnimex came from the Battletech pods. Right. Yeah, that was an interesting uh, a story about how they designed. I think I read, I read it in Michael's Unseen document where he was talking about how they were developed and how they had to be modular because of the they had to basically have the same basic files and they just had to kind of plug and play that was a really cool story i kind of watched the the kickstarter that they ran for the new mm -hmm. plastic ones yeah and i mean that's 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 going to be the look of BattleTech in the future yeah for sure but i was kind of surprised to get exposed to the whole urban mech thing no <laughs> no they made a plush urban mech yeah and you know that was i mean i sculpted the urban mech for yeah. ralph parther originally and you know aside from the the lunacy that that ac 20 is one of the smallest bore cannon mm -hmm. in the the designs <laughs> um it just wow Everyone used to hate that thing in the game people, back in the day. <laughs> people love the people love their memes. You know, it's become the meme, and I think the uh, the the nuke nuke outfitted urban mech certainly had had an effect on kind of the uh, the love for it. But uh, but yeah, the what are your thoughts on on the plastic mechs? You know, are you do you like that kind of evolution of the miniatures, or do you uh, um, you know do you wish it stayed you know, in the metal realm? The, the mechs have are, always been all over the map design-wise. Some good ones, some not so good ones. Yeah. And some of that, of course, is always going to be personal taste. Right. And so on the whole, that hasn't changed. <laughs> there, <laughs> you know, there are some good ones, there are some bad ones. Some of the redesigns actually, I think, are better than the original yeah. uh, look overall. They're, they look a little more like they're from the same culture now. Okay. I yeah, thought. between okay, I can see that between Intersphere and Clan. I um the there's some redesigns that I enjoy, but I, I like I like those kind of smooth, sexier lines of the of the originals. You know, that's it's it's a lot more blocky now. Yeah. I um, never never like the really blocky stuff. Yeah. So uh, some of but them But they've go, also done some really weird proportion things over the years. Yeah. And I never liked those either. Yeah. I do appreciate that because it's all digital now, it, it's, they can truly scale it. So it's perfectly scaled. So a 20 ton mech. Whatever is that be, means. Yeah, well. <laughs> I mean, Lord, we went around about that too, you know? Yeah. It's like, okay, fine. You know, I mean, one of the reasons the first vehicles were so big mm -hmm. was working with the concept that the mechs were supposed to be the pinnacle of technology. So if you're running the same stuff, 
in a tank, it's mm-hmm. gonna be bigger and clunkier. Yeah. Yeah. Plus well, multiple crew members, you know? It's like Well, it's interesting. I have I have a whole new perspective on the miniatures now that I started painting them. Cause you look uh-huh. at a miniature very different when you have to put paint on the miniature. Uh-huh. And so, uh, so yeah, so uh, now, back in the day, I always used to say that sculptors should be required to paint their own miniatures. Yeah. So they know what they're handing people. That is, that is true. I like that. And that when I, I one thing I do like about the plastic ones is that it's very easy to magnetize them and it's very yeah, easy to paint a magnetized mech because I can just pop off the arms, paint under the arm and go. <laughs> yeah. They're more durable too, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Uh, about what you're going to do they, you know they, they'll go the way they will the digital sculpting has changed everything yeah you know back in the day it would have been great i mean that's part of why some of my greens are no longer intact because they had to be cannibalized to, yeah, to, to make, the... make another model right all right so unsurprisingly the you know when i finally got to do the warhammer remake right then i had to do the rifleman Right, so, so we could match them up mm-hmm. and be the same. And then eventually, I got to do the longbow, and since that was the last one in line, that's the one that's most intact. Okay, this, you know, the same legs went through all three of them. Yeah, because that's how the pieces ended up surviving. Yeah, I'm, I can no longer remember why it would have worked out that way, mm-hmm. because normally I would do one all the way through, and then do the other all the way through, but. Somehow not. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, you got to figure out your way to get through, especially if you're, if the process is destroying kind of what you're creating on the way there. But it was always a possibility with the, mm-hmm. you know, that high pressure yeah. vulcanization thing would often break things mm-hmm. uh, during the process. And, you know, you just always with your fingers crossed to hope that the cavity survived so that they could cast masters into it. Yeah. And uh, usually that was the case. But then there would be, you know, things that would be need to be repaired over time, because far and away, I mean, Battle BattleTech kept Ralph Partha alive for years mm-hmm. um, because of the sales. Uh, would you hazard care to hazard a guess to what the best-selling ever BattleTech line item that Ralph Partha produced was? Ooh. Mm. I, based on what I know of how they sell now, I would almost want to say the locust, but um, just because people would go crazy over buying that uh, currently. But as far as the most <laughs> popular, popular, uh, all right, this is know. something of a know. trick question. Okay, okay. The hex base. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that think about sense. it. I mean, once you know, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah. No matter what the mech is, you need a hex base. Yeah, yeah. That's too funny. That's a money maker, huh? That's the bottom line. Uh-huh. The bottom line is the hex bases. That was the, the, that's way too. That's too funny. They cast more of those things than any mech. Well, I gotta imagine for obvious reasons. That's hilarious. But uh, no, in terms of the you know back in the day, anyway. Mm-hmm. I mean, there may have been things that changed it. But yeah. the Warhammer and the Marauder were far and away the most popular. Popular, Max. yeah. Yeah, there's, there's definitely command the highest kind of prices on the secondary market these days. They're my, the Warhammer is my favorite, you know, in terms of the look. And uh, I actually only have one Marauder and I haven't, uh, I haven't pulled it out of the blister yet because I want to save it for a professional painter to, uh, to deal with. Is it but, the uh, original uh, it's Marauder the, or mine? It's the it's yours. It's okay. um it's the raw partha. All mine are I got all mine in the blue blister, the lead free ones. That will stay together a little bit better than the original. Excellent. <laughs> and Excellent. you won't lose the auto cannon on top yeah. quite as easily. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the um yeah, those two uh the command. But yeah, what I was saying is like the in in the new plastics, people uh, the the locusts are really hard to uh, to find because everybody wants to do their locust swarms. <laughs> um, yeah. I was always fond of locusts myself. Yeah, it's a good looking mech. You know, what was it? Uh, Crusher Joe, I think. Crusher yeah, Joe, Crusher yeah. Joe. Awesome. That's one where I actually liked the Battletech redesign over the Japanese one. Yeah. yeah. No, I, the, the Battletech, I like the, I like the, 
like the Archer, I like the Archer and the original designs, uh, the, the Macross designs, but you know, all the other ones I like, I like the updates, the, the tweaks that Battletech did, but, and I'm glad it's, it's, it's nice to live in an age now where those can be produced again. So I kind of, uh, I was going through college and starting a career in, in the years where, uh, where they couldn't be used. So I came back at the right ah, time. Yes. I, I didn't even know about the whole unseen thing till Michael oh, got Michael. in touch with me. Wow. I mean, I knew there were issues with Harmony Gold, but. Yeah. Well, you, you escaped the headaches then. You got lucky. But. The, the whole thing was just a fuster cluck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But. Yeah, that's a, it's a, odd sense of entitlement by Harmony Gold, you know, looking back on it. Of, yeah. uh, you know. Well, things, things happen. I mean, you know, sort of perhaps in karma for us are, you know, got their own stuff ripped off at one point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they were talking with a toy company about doing an official battle tech line. Mm -hmm. The toy company, you know, went through the process, you know, looked at their stuff, you know, and then said, no, thanks. And then put out a line. Yeah. That was the uh, the the Mad Cat, right? The Mad Cat Timberwolf toy, if I recall. Um, Could be, but Could yeah. be. Cool. I didn't follow it that much. Yeah. yeah. Cool. But, you know, those kind of things happen. Corporate, big corporations do that all too often. Yeah. Well, it's you know, uh, happens it's even even to to bigger things than game companies. Definitely. Well, it's, uh, that's the, that's the, when you grow up, you understand the legal system and justice a little bit more is that, uh, yeah, but it ain't it's always not about, justice. It's Usually not about the big right. Ones get away with oh, it. Oh yeah. That's why was, it's not about right and wrong. It's about who's, uh, who has the most money to, to invest in attorneys. Who's got the best lawyers. Yep. Or threat of them. Yep. Definitely. I mean, the very name of Battletech, right? Yeah. Now it was Battle Droids. Yeah. Until Lucasfilm got involved. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Robert. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll circle back and I'll let you know when uh, when this goes up. Yes, sir. Um, I appreciate that. And uh, I hope this uh, is useful for you. Definitely. Definitely. Okay, man. Right. Take care, Bob. You good? Bye. Yep. Shoot some mechs. Yep. Always. <laughs>